Hello, my name is Mary Mack, and I'm the Executive Director of ACED, the Association of Certified eDiscovery Specialists. And I want to give you a warm welcome to our summer school session uh, that we will be doing today on our ACED uh, webinar platform. As always, you'll receive a, a, an email with a link to the recording of the presentation, and your questions are very, very uh, much looked forward to. Uh, the Q&A panel is down at the bottom, and you just type your question in there, and if it applies to what uh, our presenter is talking about in the moment, I'll, I'll raise it then. Otherwise, after the webinar is complete, and if we don't get to everything, you still will have an opportunity uh, to contact our presenter. We will be uh, working with Digital Evidence Challenges, the Internet of Things, and David Greedham, the Vice President of eDiscovery of RICO, is going to deliver this uh, presentation. David is a certified fraud examiner. He's also the Vice President of eDiscovery Sales and Operations at RICO uh, USA, and he is a forensic person. He is a patent holder a testifying and consulting uh, expert in the area of computer forensics, and he has several certifications in that, in that area. He's a frequent speaker at, for bar associations and CLEs, and he is the inventor and developer of Remlox, which is a uh, patented, forensically sound remote collection tool uh, that's been deployed in 37 countries throughout the, the world. He holds uh, a license, uh, as a private investigator in Texas and Florida. He's part of the High Tech Crime Network, and uh, uh, he completed his Master's of Science in Forensic Computing uh, at Cranfield uh, University um, in the United Kingdom. So he is a good friend and colleague and advisory board uh, member uh, at here at ASEDS. And we are absolutely thrilled to have him presenting. And we thank our wonderful sponsor, uh, Rico, for making him available to us uh, today for this great educational uh, webinar. David? Wow, thank you, Mary. Um, that was a very kind introduction. Um, really wanted to cover several things on, on this session, if we could. I'll just actually go back a slide. Um, we're going to be talking about the Internet of Things, but some challenges that come with that. Collection challenges, there's some changes to some federal rules which uh, play into that, uh, and, and really how traditional methods are no longer um, relevant uh, for, for, new, for new devices. So to, to discuss that, to frame it, we kind of need to go back a little bit and look at what have we been doing in computer forensics for the last 25 years. In fact, really computer forensics uh, I was fortunate to be involved in the very start of it back in the late 80s as the PC market uh, became more domestic. And uh, systems were formed and processes were documented and validated and we used hash values. We used different hash values in those days than we use now, but essentially to make sure we have an exact replica when we make a forensic image. Uh, we document the hash values before and afterwards, and the two shall match, and then you can validate that, that image is an exact replica of the original. Things started changing around 2008 <coughs> when remote technologies uh, were used. Uh, during 2007, early 2008, frowned upon. Nobody wanted to collect anything remotely. It wasn't the standard. But there's some practicalities about it. There have been some federal rule changes at the end of 2006 that drove some changes on, on metadata collection specifically. And combined with that, there were sort of geographic challenges. Home, you know, remote workers were becoming more of a thing. And if you look around now, it used to be somebody would work from home one day a month if they were lucky or two days a month. And now we have a lot of people who are working full time from home. So this was really the, the start of that. Um, so remote technologies were kind of new. You mentioned Remlocks and other tools, but things have changed now. Connected devices make it very, very different to collect and very difficult to validate, and there's just so many of them. So we really need to think differently about that. Let's go back a little bit to the kind of verifiable process of computer forensics that's got us to where we are. These are really the five pillars that have to be considered 
when you're looking at uh, what's my criteria, all right? How do I collect something and I know that I can have this validated in a court of law, take a scientific approach, and really the, the collection side becomes somewhat of a mute issue. Well, we should remember this slide because we're going to come back to this one towards the end. Um, so let's start with what is a forensic image. You know, a forensic image can be an image of anything. It can be a piece of data. It can be half of a file. It can be a whole network folder. Um, and we just refer to that generically as a forensic image. When we're talking about a full forensic image, that's really a replica of a piece of storage media. Uh, regardless of contents, if there's any contents at all, and it was very popular to do full forensic images for lots of reasons. Really, the defensibility was easier, the verification was easier. If you wanted to do some forensic analysis, you would really want a full forensic image so that you can recover things you can't recover with just copying live and active data. Here's some of the things that forensic analysis, uh, forensic analysis has allowed us to do. If you think of the red circle as a full forensic image, some of these things coming off of here are fairly simple and straightforward um, recovery or analysis techniques that you might use in an investigation, uh, some contractual dispute, uh, some criminal matters, and what have you. Interestingly, people know about deleted file recovery. You know, it's a fairly straightforward process. It's something that we do your first week of training in our forensics lab. Uh, most people know about um, tracking things like USB devices that have that have been connected to a device, and then some know about internet activity and how the Microsoft created some uh, new technology in 1995 that made the internet appear faster but actually downloaded all your web pages to some degree to a hidden system area on your computer. So then, therefore you can recover internet activity and interestingly search terms that we used during that activity. Um, some new things happening, um, timelines of systems because they're so heavily used, there's so much going on on the computer and we start getting to connected devices like tablets, um, GPS analysis, you know, obviously the the cell phones and smartphones, as, as you'd expect. Um, we've also found that there's a bigger emphasis legally on being a private investigator, a licensed private investigator, to actually perform analysis. In some states, that even includes um, collections without analysis, and there are some exceptions to that. So what's been going on? Well, why, why change, right? Well, first of all, let's talk about data sizes. We've had a massive increase in data sizes. In fact, the bottom core by IBM, the alarming uh, or the, the thing that makes you jump a little bit about that core is that of all the data in the world that we have today, of all time, that about 90% of it has been created in the last two years. And that really puts some perspective to how much data we create. There's a quote on the screen from an FBI agent from the 9-11 trials when a judge asked, well, why don't you just print everything from the hard drive and look at it that way? Um, so really data size is uh, um, massive growth as we, you know, we talk about big data and what have you. We should probably change that to massive data uh, now. If you think of, it, of data sizes from a... Um, uh, what, where they're coming from. I mean, there's some, some stats on the screen here that are fairly old, actually, and it's just the most um, the most recent accurate numbers we can get because there's lots of estimations. But if you look at 2013, you know, a good five, five and a half years ago, 892 billion emails were sent each day. Um, that, people suspect, has grown by 100-fold. If we put data sizes in perspective of paper, and sometimes it helps people understand if they could come from a paper world, really what does it equate to? If we look at a one gigabyte thumb drive and the capacity that has, um, they can store up to 500,000 pages. If you think about that as printed material and that little thumb drive, that, that really um, makes you think about uh, how much data there really is out there and how we store it. And, and you see now a one terabyte drive, even the entry level computer systems now have at least a one terabyte drive. So you can see how much data they're um, capable of storing. 
uh, Abdi likes visuals, right? So if you imagine this is the Empire State Building and this is a stack of paper, uh, actually not end to end but stacked, that's equivalent to around about 15 gigabytes. Obviously, some variables on how the data is printed and what have you. So we have a lot of data. Uh, here's probably part of the reason why we have a lot of data is social media. And in September 2011, a lot of people, a lot of analysts said, you know what, we think social media has peaked. It was for the kids. The kids have got a bit older. They're not using it. Uh, don't invest in social media. It's going to fade away. They also said that about the Internet in the early 80s as well, interestingly. Well, in July 2018, the latest numbers that we have, you can see how the numbers have changed dramatically over that um, six, seven-year period. Looking at YouTube in particular, it's gone from 2 billion views a day to 1 billion hours viewed. They don't even measure in views anymore. They're measuring how many hours people sit on YouTube viewing. A couple of new ones as well that were in around in September 2011, uh, Instagram and Snapchat. And, uh, Snapchat now has 187 million uh, daily snaps. So it obviously creates a lot more data there. I just want to touch on this. It's kind of a little bit outside of uh, the theme of what we're talking about, but I've been asked a lot of times um, by friends, colleagues, and clients, is social media discoverable? Well, I think this case from a few years ago now um, totally confirms that it's discoverable because we had an attorney getting sanctioned uh, for advising his client um, to allegedly advise his client, I should say, to um, remove some pictures from his social media because uh, he was scared that the uh, adverse party would find it. And he went to a judge, and the judge said litigation hold includes social media when appropriate, and sanctions were granted as to $522,000 against the attorney personally and $180,000 against the plaintiff for doing what his attorney told him to do. The attorney was ultimately uh, had his license revoked for five years. So if anybody asks if social media is discoverable, I think there's your answer. So as we look at connected devices, we have new challenges. Um, this is a kind of a sad case from Australia uh, where a, um, a gentleman took his own life and left his will. He actually sent it by a text message uh, who he wanted to have his things, and he gave him the bank account number, the PIN number, and things like that on his phone, and he took his own life. The text message didn't send because it had a lack of, there wasn't enough signal, and a court in Brisbane ruled that the wording of the text indicated that this was intended to be his will, and they uh, considered it legally his will. It was actually an unsent text message. Um, this is a copy of an email I received late last year um, from um, BMW and told me that my car is due for a service. And I thought, yeah, this is just a marketing campaign. And when I looked into it, there's actually my car connected to the BMW servers and said the quality of my oil was within 10% or the threshold of 10% where it was considered no longer good to use. And I generated an email to me automatically saying come in for a service. He even had a link for me to actually schedule it without talking to anybody. Just go online, click the link, follow it, and, and make a service. And I got to thinking, <laughs> wow, that's kind of a little scary, right? We're connected. Uh, and just by living daily life, just by driving your car, you're connected. <clears throat> Shortly after that, I... um. I went to Chicago. I took a journey to Chicago, and I decided that um, I did what I would normally do. I check, you know, Alexa for the weather. Uh, I actually picked up some dry clean on the way to the airport. Checked in online. Um, drove to the airport. Go through a tag system, a toll-in system. I forgot to set my home alarm, so I did that remotely. I parked my car. And I used a smart parking app because I can never remember where I parked it. I say pre check, I actually went to the airline club, just several things that you know you would do as your normal course of business and, and traveling. Um, when I got on the plane, I downloaded some music from Spotify, so I had that, I had Wi Fi on the plane, used a VPN to update some things, uh, landed, got an Uber to the hotel, and I actually went straight to my hotel room using the Bluetooth key. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but not only can you check in online with some hotels, you can actually 
select your room and you can just bypass reception go straight to the room use your mobile device uh with the with the app and it will unlock your door you don't even get a key so um i thought wow i did a lot a lot of things there without really talking to anybody and i started thinking i wonder how much data i actually created and so being in a hotel room in the evening with some time on my hands and uh, the background I have, of course, I started trying to work it out. And I worked it out best as I could. Um, there was a couple of things that I just couldn't get the information for easily. But I thought, I, let me just highlight the areas where I actually created data using connected devices. And, of course, it was all of it, every single part of it. In fact, I created about 632 megabytes in a period of six hours door-to-door -door from my house in Houston to the hotel in Chicago. And um, I thought, wow, you know, put that back into a paper world, that's 300,000 pages of paper if it was printed all there and thereabouts. A lot of data. So, and then I started looking at, okay, why are we so connected? What What's going on? Well, we have 3.3 billion internet users throughout the world which interestingly was the same as the world population 53 years ago. Um, there's 21 billion things connected to the internet and that's growing 200 plus per second as more devices are getting connected. And so let's define what is a thing, right? So a, a, an internet of thing or a thing is, is really um, a device that can connect uh, and communicate um, sometimes only one way, but typically two way. They can track information. Uh, refers to the ever growing network of physical objects, and it really needs an IP address to connect. Anything that has an IP address has the potential to connect uh, to the internet and be a thing. Therefore, the Internet of Things. So I started looking to, okay, we're going to run out of IP addresses soon, right? If all these devices are connecting, we have 21 billion or whatever that number is, we're going to start running out of IP addresses. And some time ago, we changed from IP version 4 to IP version 6 because essentially we ran out of IP addresses. So I thought, how many things can actually be connected? And I would give a $1,000 Amazon gift card if anybody chooses, but... Um, we actually calculate this is the number of devices that can be connected um, before we run out of IP addresses. So I don't know what the number is. I don't know how to say it. Um, it is a very, very large number. In fact, we have that many IP addresses. A great quote by Steve Liebson is that we could assign an IP address to every atom on the surface of the Earth and still have enough addresses left to do another 100 plus Earths. So it's not likely, it's not even remotely likely that we're going to have IP addresses anytime in the future. So that paves the way for more and more and more connected devices. So how does it work? It, it's not a single technology, lots of different technologies coming together. Um, what is really interesting is that if you look at the slide now, uh, ARFID chips are very, very popular and in devices that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and you hear about nano devices. But if you look at this, what they call smart dust, um, uh, 0.15 times 0.15 of a millimeter each, and I believe there's probably smaller ones that we don't even know about. And some countries, they spray them on shoppers as they leave so they can track their shopping habits where they go to next. Of course, that wouldn't happen here because the laws against things like that. But these devices are used in warfare. If you need communications between two points um, in, in some location where, where um, you know, there's not traditional methods of communications, these devices will actually, I'm sorry, my screen changed a little bit there. Uh, these devices, you can have a helicopter or a plane or something go across and just spread them across and have short-range communications and have tens of thousands of them that will create communications between two points, and that's been used fairly commonly in warfare. So where are we at? So during uh, 2006, we actually passed a threshold where more connected devices than people existed um, on the face of the Earth. By 2020, they're estimating 6.5 devices um, 
uh, per person. And I look around and I think, well, I have more than that already. But if you think of all the different people in different countries that don't have some of the things that we have here, um, 6.5 devices is actually a lot. And I think I did a, a calculation for myself. I think I had 12, if you included a few geeky little things, which I want to share with you in a moment. So by 2020, 50 billion devices are connected. You can see some of the, it might be a little small on the screen, but you can see some of the things that, and when they've been introduced and what's really going to drive that number up. A lot of healthcare devices, no surprise, but a lot of commerce uh, adopting Internet of Things, and, and we'll go through that. You can see some of the new types of devices. I think we've been aware of GPSs and vehicles for a long time. Uh, and smart devices, of course, but really smart devices to a new level, tracking things that um, you're probably not aware of or it's just becoming publicly known now. Medical devices, a lot of you know, Fitbits and, and, and that type of device, um, but really um, seeing a lot of commerce now adopting, um, adopting this for business. Just remember that number at the bottom. I can't say it. I'm not even attempt to say it. But when these devices and these categories are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So enjoying research on this presentation um, and working with some of my colleagues, we found some really interesting connected devices. Kind of, you know, a little bit quirky. Uh, if we look at a smart toothbrush. This smart toothbrush not only checks how many uh, revolutions uh, is going around and how often you brush your teeth, but it checks that you brush it hard enough or not too hard to cause gum damage. It checks that you do it for the right period of time, and it will send you an alert if you don't. What about the happy fork? Oh, I'd say in my case it might be the unhappy fork. Um, a fork that really tracks not just how much you eat, um, but it tracks how quickly you eat, or your eating habits entirely, how long it takes you to eat a meal, and it will give you feedback based on, hey, you should slow down, you should take more breaks during your eating, or you don't have enough protein on your fork. Um, really lots of sensors in this device. The smart egg tray is a mystery to me because I guess when I was a kid, um, which is a lot of years ago now, I guess, we didn't even keep eggs in the fridge. But it seems like everybody keeps eggs in the fridge now, and if you go to the store and you buy some more, you've really got to track, you know, use the oldest ones first. And literally a device that you can sit on the couch and look at how many eggs you've got and, and when they're considered out of date. Of course, I live in Texas, and we do a lot of cooking out. So why would you get off the couch to check how much gas you have in your propane tank when there's an app for that? Um, it'll give you current temperature outside, so you know if you want to go out and sit in the blistering summer heat now that we're in summer school. Or uh, if you want to, you know, just use something in the house, it'll tell you how long your gas will last or your propane will last, depending on how many burners you have on, all on an app. Smart washing machine. It'll tell you all sorts about your load, not just be efficient, so only put the right amount of water in and the right amount of detergent and conditioner, but the site will dictate its own cycle based on the content of the clothes. What about the smart piggy bank? I mean, we're teaching our kids young, right? This is a great thing. It's called a portfolio, and it wirelessly connects to a, uh, an app and allows you to encourage your children to have set savings goals. And its nose lights up every time you put a coin in, and it makes a little noise, and it can hold up to $100 in quarters called the portfolio. These are uh, for sale on your favorite shopping online experience for about $15, and they are actually very, very popular. We're teaching our youngsters how to save using connected devices. Smart lighting, I may be a little bit guilty of this myself, um, I can control my lighting from a, a device. I mean, you know, the alternative is to do it the old-fashioned way and actually get up and turn it on. Well, who would do that these days? Um, you can control it bulb by bulb. You can control the color, the hue, the shading. 
Um, and I probably spend more time playing with the device than I would actually if I just go up and turn the light on. What about Bluetooth enabled insoles? Um, really tracking your, your workouts, the direction, the orientation, the speed, the uh, pulse rates from your feet at the same time, uh, checks um, your heart, obviously the heart rate and the condition of the heartbeat. Um, a lot more, uh, it, we kind of a, a shoe off of some of the uh, medical devices that we've seen, such as Fitbits and, and so on. Um, these are not so new anymore. Uh, the smart garbage cans, um, inappropriately named Big Belly, and uh, they really track when they're full, when they need to be emptied. They send messages to um, the uh, through the cloud into where, it's, where the, where the um, garbage is going to go for recycling. It lets the um, it lets the uh, pickup people know when to come and actually pick it up and when it's going to be full. And um, you know they'll get a message: Hey, today you've got seven big bellies to empty because they're at seventy five percent capacity. Um, actually, I first saw these on the west coast in Portland and Seattle. I was in New York City last week, and I saw them around the streets in New York City. So these are very, very common everyday things now. I have a slide about that. I'll show you later on on really how that workflow works. Uh, smart socks. I mean, how many people have sore feet, right? And I can tell you for the young people on this call, it's coming your way a later life. And so you really want to make sure you don't have too much pressure on one foot. If you're out hiking or you're working out, it will literally check the pressure points and guide you on on maybe different footwear or um, different techniques on, on hiking and so on. For any of you old enough to remember the movie Total Recall, I think it started Arnold Schwarzenegger back in, I guess, the 80s, they actually had this in there as a as a set in the fee. I think it was set in 2050 or something like that. And these are about three thousand dollars. It's basically a tablet that you put in your bed, uh, your bathroom, and you can have apps on it, and you can watch online video while you're shaving. You can look at the weather. You can tweet from the bathroom. I mean, the possibilities are endless. And they started off about fifteen thousand dollars about. Four years ago, and as they got better and made more efficiently, I think a full size one now is about three thousand dollars. Holy cow! We're actually even got devices on our farm animals to help with um, keep. You know, who needs a sheepdog anymore? You can know where your cows are by just uh, tracking them. Sensors are implanted, allows farmers to monitor health. Obviously, location. Um, the health benefits for animals as a farmer, I'm sure, is extremely important. But the ultimate result is to produce as much milk as possible uh, and, and meat, I guess, as possible for consumption based on the health of the animal. So some cows, I'm told, will just sit in a field all day and stay in a field and do nothing. And these... these um, these tracking devices can actually help them to encourage them to get up and walk around, which apparently is very good for them. So a lot of data being created there. You know, 200 meg of information per year doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think of that as printed material, um, it really is. So, so there's some quirky things, right? But how does this really affect us in business? Well, G estimate they're going to. Talk about saving $150 billion by the implementation of um, connected devices. And, and it's really interesting because we, we talked a little bit about uh, garbage collection, and I think I have a slide on that in just a moment. But um, there's so many areas that this touches, you know, rail, oil and gas, healthcare, um, just the, the power grid. Uh, I was talking to... Uh, a friend of the weekend was a pilot, and he was telling me how, how aviation is impacted by that. So let me sit on this slide for a moment and just talk about the impact of big belly and big belly type devices. So what really happens? So the, the trash can it gets full or gets to a, a capacity where it starts sending messages saying, hey, I'm nearly full. 
and um, and we'll send the information to a local access point, maybe something on a LAN post, uh, and to the cloud, and just says, hey, um, I've got this uh, sensing as a service going on there. I'm going to send a message to the council, to the recycling plant, to the manufacturing plant, uh, to the authorities to make sure that all health and safety is being complied with. And I'm also going to send uh, messages to um, the garbage collection people. I'm sorry, the slides keep changing. Uh, to the garbage collectors so that they can go out and be more efficient uh, and actually go collect uh, they know which garbage cans need emptied rather than just driving around the route. Now, as as simplistic as that sounds, that is massively efficient. The trash cans only get emptied when they need to. They're not getting overflowing. The recycling plant know about this stuff is coming in. They know exactly how much is coming in and when it's going to get there, which in turn allows them to have efficiencies in their process. Lots of different use cases. You know, we know about health. We've talked a little bit about industry now with cities. Um, yeah, lots of offices. Now, the, the simplest thing where you walk past a light in an office and it comes on because when they've just gone home, they don't want to leave the lights on. Those devices now being connected and going back to some management company who can turn the lights on and off if the sensor's broken. Um, in the home, some of the consumer things we talked about. Um, mobility, I, I learned recently about a special connected camera that goes on, back, uh, on the underside of taxi cabs in a, uh, in a Chinese city and it actually tracks the condition of the road and takes constant photographs, sends them up to the cloud and artificial intelligence takes all that information and calculates the condition of the roads and more importantly which roads need the repairs most and that will drive um, which which roads they put their their attention to, where they where they send their people to to repair these roads, and I I can't help besides they seem to be auto loading themselves. Um, so very cool technology, right? Very little chips. You saw those Arthur chips, how small they are. You put a camera to that, it can it can send a signal, and now the road authorities are just looking at what the artificial intelligence kicks out and says, okay, this street here is the worst condition street we have. That's the next thing to be repaired. The security risks with this, absolutely. Um, Denial of um, distributed denial of service attacks is the most common thing. You've probably heard something in the news about um, uh, cameras being used to access a website, and, and this can be used for bad purposes. Typically, if you send 20 million requests to a website, it's not designed to handle that, and it will crash. And it has been used um, in that way, and security on um, connected devices is not where it needs to be. A lot of organizations are doing better with that and ultimately will get there, but the speed that these things are being released and new devices on the market, that's, that's very much a challenge. Um, interesting story about somebody who used a connected fish tank in a casino to get into their network. Uh, you know, casinos spend a lot of time uh, have a lot of sensitive information there and left the fish tank um, unprotected and accessed direct into the network. Other privacy concerns? Well, absolutely. Um, you may have heard about the Portland woman who basically said Alexa recorded a conversation and sent it to a contact. And the strangest series of events where Alexa must have heard certain words or thought there were certain words and then followed a certain routine and the conversation just continued and certain keywords were picked up on and a, a, a message was recorded and sent to a personal contact. Um, when Amazon was asked about this, they obviously put a bug fix in place, but said that it, um, it's the most unusual of circumstances, but again, there's privacy there. Uber have just applied for a patent that would detect drunk drivers, uh, sorry, drunk passengers, because they don't want to be taking drunk passengers home. And while that, you can see the value in that, it, is that actually 
a privacy concern. Of course, this year we've had GDPR come to us and those crazy Europeans have got all these privacy laws. Um, some of that's coming here as well. We see some states adopting some of them. So are there privacy concerns with connected devices? Absolutely. In recent headlines, you, you may have seen a lot of these um, fairly uh, well-known. Uh, most interesting one, I think, is that a pacemaker data is being used as a connected device in an arson trial. The allegation is that, um, well, um, fire department were called, fire in a house, the sole uh, person in the house uh, is rescued in a ladder from his bedroom window and comes down and he has a bag of stuff that he collected, important documents, and the fire department saved the guy. Uh, investigators looked at the circumstances and suspected the fire might have been started and it might have been arson, uh, potentially for insurance. And the uh, person who was rescued actually had a pacemaker. And they took the data from his pacemaker that showed that his heart rate was not elevated until he got onto the ladder. And the allegation is that if your house is on fire and you were calling 911 to come get some help, that your heart rate your heartbeat might be elevated. So how does this impact your case? I mean, we've seen we've seen vehicle forensics we've talked about. We've seen um, connected devices being used in energy field and and on oil platforms and and how they can um, show circumstances and, and series of events. Um, here's a here's a fairly recent case where uh, a drone gang were jailed after actually. 49 flights before they get caught and they were sending drones over prisons to drop off drugs and cell phones and what have you, um, you know, using connected devices to do that. Um, NIST kind of responded a little bit to this and, said, and created some drone images and they really encouraged forensic examiners to uh, practice on these images, I guess, uh, for all the different types of drones and, and you know, because there was a crime involved, uh, NIST naturally tried to find some solution. But drones represent a minor fraction of the amount of connected devices. If you think of the connected devices as a beach of sand, the drones represent probably one or two grains of that sand. So there's certainly more focus on how do you perform forensics against um, some devices and this is a great effort uh, and, and great support for, by NIST to actually do this. But again, it's truly scratching the surface knowing the number of devices that we anticipate are going to be connected by 2020. And the, um, the, just the actual large variety, I think, from a drone point of view, I think NIST provided 15 images from 15 drones and they said look just get you get familiar with the data sets I think during one of the investigations they found uh, some credit card number stored on the drone which I can only assume is from some registration process at some stage if you remember this slide we talked about this earlier these were the foundations of computer forensics these were the things that you had to have in place if you were going to have evidence validated well, with all these connected devices and volatile data, things have changed. In fact, these are no longer applicable. The only one that is applicable now is the evidence gathered must be authenticated and be admissible in the court of law. And the, the question is, how do you do that, right? And how do you, because the data is changing all the time, if you think of something fairly simple like a social media profile, how do you excuse me? How do you collect that data when it's changing during the collection? Um, certainly, is a challenge, and really, we have to ask differently. There's some questions we have to ask that we didn't ask before. Where is the information stored? Is it on the device? Is it in a cloud? Is it both? Um, uh, who owns the information? Uh, what kind of information is stored? And, you know, some some cloud service providers are actually very, very helpful with this. There's a lot of work being done with Alexa-style devices and the Google devices. And, you know, really the, um, the cloud service providers have been very, very helpful. And, and, you know, they want to know as well. Um, 
Who owns the information? A really interesting question. Um, when you sign the EULA to use this free app, do you give away your rights to that information? Is that why you start getting emails about a new type of drone or extra batteries or something like that? Are there any privacy concerns? You know, we're all we're all definitely aware of privacy at the moment, um, of what's been going on in Europe and, and some of the changes in California, more recently Texas in the US. How can the information be captured? These are questions we have to ask, and I'm not suggesting that if you're in a litigation support role and that you have a matter where you have custodians to collect from, that you're going to have to go collect everything they've got connected, but it would be wise to consider if connected devices are in play here. And at this stage, in most cases, they're probably not. But to, to do your due diligence and to ask the right questions, you should certainly ask that. And bear in mind, a connected device would also be considered a smartphone. And we see more and more smartphones in play. We see more and more vehicle uh, GPS systems in play where there's um, maybe a, 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 some kind of wreck uh, or some, a car being stolen, something like that. Um, so again, it's like social media. You don't have to capture everything and, and stop them living their life, but it would certainly be good to ask these questions if appropriate, if certain connected devices uh, are in play. By example, um, I work with a client who has not just dual factor, but multi-factor authentication, where they have to put in a password, it will send them a text message, they put that in, and they also have to have a key fob and the key fob has to go against the sensor, and um, that's the third part of uh, authentication. They get connected. The information on that key fob can be very, very important if you're looking at who was at the keyboard, who logged on at the time, who created this document. So we do have to ask differently. Um, we're going to have different processes. Data collections are going to be very different. Um, it's not the traditional, let's connect it to a write blocker and let's create a forensic image. Um, you don't want to be able to do that. If you're collecting from cloud, how are you going to collect the cloud to a write blocker? The cloud stores data differently. It doesn't store all of the data that traditionally a workstation might. Uh, volatile data means that, you know, forget hash values. There's, there's really, I mean, not saying you shouldn't hash it, but you're not going to be able to validate by hash phones, and some cell phones already are, are at that state. Um, you know, when I talked about those five pillars and all the things that we did back in the late 80s, early 90s, by putting processes and procedures together, um, we created documentation that has really survived the test of time, and that's still good and valid for static devices like workstations and laptops and and even network data, if you, you collect it in a certain way. But for these types of connected devices, it's absolutely going to be different. Um, we've seen a lot of people doing online collections and actually creating a video of that, where you might start a video app running, um, go to time.gov to validate the time, do the collection, it's all been videoed, hash your collection, so you, at least you've got a hash value of what you've collected. If you need to pass that to uh, um, an opposing party or you need to validate that through documentation later during an audit, at least you have a hash value there. When you finish the collection, go back to time.gov and validate the time and stop the video, then hash the video file. I mean, seriously, it is different. Um, it is very different. Self-collection could be impossible. I mean, you're going to have to rely on, uh, if somebody says to you, hey, go and collect the data from your Fitbit, and you produce it as a custodian, that there is no way to validate that. And if somebody goes back to that Fitbit, unless you've literally powered it off and kept it away from any wireless charging, um, there's been no way to validate it. So challenges ahead, right? We have to think differently. We have to have different processes. And um, we have to think how that one pillar that remains, right, how do you authenticate it and make it admissible in court, in a court of law? And that court of law covers tribunals, mediations, trial, depositions, so on. Well, fortunately for us, um, FedRAM came at a good time. Uh, sorry, the federal rules of evidence came at a good time 
where they made some amendments in December of last year to 902, which allows us to deal with this. I'm going to touch on this just briefly. Um, the new addition uh, to the rules really allowed for authentication of devices by affidavit or some kind of statement by a qualified person. And I think this was the real core change, was that instead of being a forensic expert and having to sit around court all day for several days, maybe even a week, uh, to introduce evidence, you can now do that with a, 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 an affidavit. Uh, a statement that's notarized, but it still has to be a qualified person. It still has to be somebody who says, this is pr these are the processes that I used. Um, here's the validation process. Um, but rather than sitting around running up the bill, um, you can do this by uh, an affidavit so that the attorneys or the litigators can e introduce this evidence at a time that suits them, not having because hey my expert sat there and he's been there two and a half days and I'm getting a big bill for this so that was great that was the main purpose and there's a reality about sitting around court waiting to introduce evidence uh, I spent a couple of weeks in a federal courthouse in Maryland uh, waiting to basically introduce evidence and really give no opinion on it and you know apart from being extremely boring because in federal court you really can't take anything with you such as a phone or a laptop um, the client is getting charged for all that time and, and, and nobody wants that. So that was the main purpose of the change, I believe. But there is a caveat to that which helps us with connected devices. Is that uh, Rule 14 um, and the advisory committee noted that the rule is flexible enough to allow certifications through processes other than comparison of hash values, including by other reliable means of identification provided by future technologies. To me, that is, okay, the gold standard of matching hash values to introduce evidence, we understand as an advisory committee, we understand that that is no longer going to be the gold standard, and there's going to be other ways. Now, we don't know what those ways are yet, um, and we don't know of a future technologies that we even know about yet, so we can't even say you should do X, Y, and Z, but you still need somebody who is competent with forensic collections and can stand there and certify how they did it, maybe in this case by an affidavit because of, of the previous change, um, but hash values are not the only way, and, and we're really pleased to see that because how do you hash something that's changing during the process? And when you look at what you've collected, it will not compare the two hash values and not match. So good time for these uh, amendments in December of uh, 2017 to, um, to be introduced. I think the key here is best practices. Best practices is never going to change. If you do all the right things and you do the best that you can and you can stand behind it and validate it in some way, and maybe that's an affidavit, but be aware that if it's an affidavit, you still need to be a qualified person that can certify what was done and how the data was obtained. All right, so to summarize, um, and maybe we have uh, time for a couple of questions at the end. Good, historical good. computer forensics, um, some, some historical uh, authentication methods will no longer be the standard for many new devices. Now, for the things that we do daily, workstations, network data, SharePoint, all these type of things that you collect normally, they will still apply. They've been, you know, they've been set in stone 25 years plus. Um, but for the new devices, that it's not going to work, frankly. Um, you know, we're very highly connected. There's going to be 50 billion people, uh, 50 billion devices, excuse me, um, connected by 2020. Um, that's a massive amount of de uh, devices. Um, but it can be valuable in your litigation. As an organization, we've seen connected devices used this year uh, probably a dozen times. Um, now, that's still a small amount compared to your typical data storage, but that's a, you know, last year was maybe six times. And here we are in early August, probably a dozen times. Maybe by the end of the year, that's 20. Maybe next year, it's 50. Maybe the year after, it's 200. Yeah, as more and more industries adopt connected devices, I, um, 
I recently had a grandchild and I was uh, over in Seattle with uh, my daughter when she was at the hospital and visiting with her in the hospital before she gave birth and a nurse came in and, and did what they do and check all the things and everything, but everything was connected. There was nothing hardwired, even even the power. They were running off battery. They were all connected devices. They were sending messages back to the nurse's station so they could track the health of the patient and the baby um, before birth and the, the climate in the room, the quality of air, the temperature, the humidity. They tracked all of this while sat on a nurse's station. And they had, I don't know, 15 delivery rooms where they tracked it all there. So, yes, it's absolutely being used. Um, and, you know, in, in a medical field, and we know healthcare, we know that healthcare has been really a good early adopter, but many, many other uh, you know, industries now adopting it. We talked about GE, how they're going to save $150 billion. We do have to think differently about collections. Um, just saying it's hard to collect. Uh, we've never done this before. We're not going to collect it. May get you into trouble. It might be the right approach. I don't know. But um, data can be collected. Just remember the uh, the one pillar that remains is you have to validate how you collected it. And that doesn't mean hash values anymore. It means who did it, what's their experience, how can you have confidence that you connect, you collected what was actually there. So techniques like video in the collection if it's cloud-based, uh, making sure you have the right people doing it that have experience in those devices, uh, and so on. <coughs> <clears throat> the good news is that the 902 amendments do allow flexibility, um, which is very, very welcome, because, like, like we said a few times, some of those um, some of those traditional methods are just not applicable. So, with that, Mary, I don't know if we have any questions on the Q and A, but I'm certainly happy to answer answer any questions that we have. Oh, we certainly do have questions, and, and not just how did you make those curtains go. Um, so one question, <laughs> David, is <laughs> it's a very nice slide. Uh, David has his contact information up, and he's at David A. Greetham, G-R-E-E-T-H-A-M, on Twitter, and his email is up there, david.greetham at rico-usa.com. Um, David, um, somebody would like to know, uh, what did you use to discover or um, identify the data from your trip um, when, when you were telling us about the uh, check into hotels and et cetera? Great question. Um, I use lots of things. I used my mobile device was the primary source. And, of course, it being my mobile device, I had all the credentials to go to the cloud servers to check them there. <clears throat> There's a couple of things that I struggled with. Um, the, the, Hil the Hilton app and the Bluetooth key, I could only get information from one side of that, which was my side on my device. Um, but it was a process. I spent several hours um, uh, room service dinner and several hours working working through that data. Um, so because it was my device and I had access to my credentials on my device, that certainly made it a lot easier. And I think one of the things that you're going to find is that when you're dealing with a custodian's device, you're going to you're going to need their passwords and you're going to need their you know login details for their easy tag or or the the pass for the toll roads and and for the pre pre check details and things like that. So I use primarily my device and a combination of devices, uh, forensic devices, to extract the data from there. I don't think there's one device that's going to get you everything you need. Truthfully, uh, most forensic um, uh, tool providers kind of tend to focus on one area, and some of them are very, very good. Um, but just to say, hey, I'm going to go buy this device here, I'm going to plug in, and I'm going to get everything I need, unfortunately, is a pipe dream. Um, that That's not going to work. So I guess the short answer is I use my own device. I use some of the cloud services that they connected to. Again, that was quite easy because I had my credentials. <clears throat> and you can download um, reports and usage reports as CSVs, typically. And I combined it all together, and, and there was a couple of things that I couldn't get, and kind of ran out of time. Um, 
and and I'd use the information the next day. So I got to a certain time where, hey, I've got 95% of it. That's as much as I can get right now. So, um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, lots of different sources, but certainly being my device made it a whole lot easier. Interesting. And are you seeing stipulations or other agreements between parties on the collection methods and personnel uh, to sort out some of those authentication and validation uh, issues for these emerging data sources? Um, I'm actually seeing more conversation about it. I don't know if I've, I think I might have seen one or two stipulations, but I'm seeing more conversation. And, and the reality is a lot of attorneys who are really not familiar with this are kind of want to say, look, you know, we'll hold on that. Let's go for the custodial data that's easier to get, whether it's from your Office 365 or your workstation or your Domino server, wherever it is. Um, but we are seeing some attorneys who are using connected devices as a um almost as a strategy hey are you aware of this we think this custodian yeah you, know, you tell us that he was out of the country at the time but if we have cell phone records we can check we can try we can check his gps and we can see where he was connected to which cell towers he was connected to 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 validate things and i think that for attorneys that were not in the know, I think that's a little scary for them. And for attorneys that are on this call, I'd encourage them to get some level of knowledge or some second level of knowledge. Um, it can really be the thing that that, um, <clears throat> that tears open the litigation, and you can, you know, it favorably. If you if your adverse party, or in fact, if your party have data that proves the circumstances on a connected device, you surely want to know that. Uh, but to kind of answer your question, I've seen some agreements, more than stipulations, that say we'll keep connected devices on the back burner, we'll ask our custodians to preserve them, stop using them. Uh, and some of those cases are ongoing, so whether or not they actually do introduce this as part of the e-discovery protocol remains to be seen. Excellent. So going back to a, a, a well-known device, a USB, um, are you, you're, I'm assuming you're able to uh, access the files on a USB, or can you know that a specific USB has been connected to another device? The data for that wouldn't actually come from the USB device. It would come, it would come from the device where it was connected to. So, by example, if you, we see quite commonly, actually, from a forensics perspective, alleged theft of trade secrets. Somebody leaves the company, they plug in a USB drive or an external hard drive, which essentially operates in a similar way, and they copy off the client list or the secret source or whatever it is, and they go to their new employees. Well, the analysis you could perform from a forensic aspect on, that dev on the actual computer, whether it's a laptop or, or whatever it is, that would show you when the USB was de the USB device or the external hard drive was uh, connected, there are some other files within Windows that will show you what was getting accessed at that time. There'll be linked files to some of the files. as a thing called a jump drive. There, there is other evidence that would show you that not only was the USB device connected, but files were moved, files were copied. And interestingly, what's recorded on the system where the USB device has been connected doesn't just include the make and model, it also includes the electronic serial number. Because we've had some people say, oh yeah, here's the drive I connected, I'm sorry, it was just my personal stuff, and it has a different serial number, so the custodian's giving you a same make and model, but a different serial number to try fool you. So that goes back to having a full forensic image of a computer to be able to perform that kind of investigative analysis and produce that um, in the litigation process. Interesting. So we are at the top of the hour, so I want to be respectful of, of people's time. We do have a couple more questions. David, can you hang on for a minute or two? Sure. Or, uh, of course. Uh, excellent. Okay. So uh, what do you think of the data transfer project between Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Twitter? Will more tech companies make this type of archive and migration of data available? And how does this for affect uh, forensics? That's a really good question. What do I think of it, first of all? I think that 
Um, it's a great idea. I think it ultimately might be flawed because what you're really doing here is having competitors trying to work together and there'll be how they're going to charge for it, who's ultimately going to have access control uh, and what have you. From a forensics perspective, I think anything that's really to do with data storage in a cloud environment is different. Um, certain information is recorded and certain information isn't that you would typically see recorded on a an on-premise file server or a desktop laptop and so on so I think it's I think it's um, it's very interesting to watch I know there's some things in Europe where uh, with the GDPR um, coming to play in May of this year there are some conversations about how they can have central repositories regardless of the service provider because it's going to be easier to administer some of the pretty tough GDPR rules or requirements um, so I, I think it'll play out and we'll see how it plays out it's nice to think that all these companies will work nicely together and maybe I'm a, little, I'm a tad skeptical and I hope it does play out Okay, and then how, what would be the proper process to collect data from the various collaboration app applications? Yeah, and it depends which they are. <clears throat> In some cases, it's, it's really about where the data is stored and when you can get access to. So we see a lot of collaboration. I mean, you can go back to even Instant Messenger, which is essentially a collaboration app. Um, uh, some of the new things that Microsoft are doing, um, it really depends on where it's stored and access rights. And each one, because there's not a golden rule that says, hey, you know, if you're collecting a collaboration app, you will get this field, this field, this field, and this. Unfortunately, there's not. There's not a standard there. It is very much manufacturer or software provider specific. So there's not one answer to that, unfortunately. I can tell you that I've found that um, some of the things that Microsoft have developed, they've been very... Um, good about recording the kinds of fields uh, and the information that, as a forensic examiner you would want. Excellent, excellent. We have a couple of suggestions. One is um, uh, USB uh, data can come from a monitoring tool like a Digital Guardian. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. And the same person has also uh, giving, given us in words your IPv6 uh, 340 undecillion, 282 decillion, 366 nonillion. So anyway, the next time you give this uh, uh, presentation, David, uh, you will have these words to say. <laughs> and so I want to You're thank very you for a fabulous... <laughs> <laughs> you're very brave. You're very brave people for even attempting that, Mary. I'm congratulations on even attempting that number. So we are uh, we are absolutely thrilled uh, to that many uh, decimal places that you came here to uh, to uh, teach in our summer school. We're so glad that everybody uh, who was listening on the line also dedicated an hour to learning about the Internet of Things and stretching ourselves as e-discovery professionals. We thank you, David. We thank Rico for making you available and for being a fabulous sponsor. We're going to be looking forward to seeing you at ILTA uh, for our monumental ACEDS cruise that will be going down the Potomac at, at ILTA. And uh, look for us at various chapter events throughout, throughout the world. Um, we are going global uh, with all sorts of interest uh, and activity uh, throughout the world to educate and to bring you together uh, as a community to advance your career and your organization's uh, initiatives. So we're very grateful to all of you. Looking forward to seeing all of you on another ACED Summer School webinar. And thank you very much, uh, Deja. Take us out. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for having you attended. <laughs>